Okay, I'm Jasmine, and my project was our signal transmission close to a dielectric boundary. So our, well, my project was relevant to the Ariana experiment, which is the Antarctic Ross Ice Shelf Antenna Array. And so what that is, is basically detects um, high energy neutrinos and high energy cosmic rays. So as a high energy neutrino and cosmic ray passes through the ice and hits an air molecule, respectively, those uh, emit radio pulses. So Ariana, those are um, detectors like embedded in the ice set up to receive those radio pulses. So that covers like a wider span of area rather than like an actual physical detector that you would have to build. So it gives you more of an area and it's less expensive than building like a physical detector. So um, a portion that, another portion that KU is working on that my project is more relevant to is Steven and Sasha, they're building a calibration source or like a transmitter that is going to be put in the ice and going to be used to make sure that Ariana is actually receiving these radio pulses and that is going in, I believe, I guess in Antarctica in December 2017. So this calibration source is going to be sending pulses, and a worry with that is going to be destructive interference. So like Raphael and Cole were talking about before, is when you're emitting a radio pulse, there's going to be two different paths. There's a direct path and there's going to be a reflected path. And so this reflected path can um, destructively interfere with a direct path. And if that happens, then you're not going to be able to see the, um, the direct path at all, which is not ideal because that's like your end goal. So um, this uh, calibration is there to make sure that this destructive interference isn't happening. So our testing is kind of a rudimentary way of seeing if there's a geometric way to set up it's like a physical geometric way to lessen the effects of the uh, destructive interference and to see if um, the destructive interference is going to play a part in this at all. So the basics of our testing, this is um, a diagram that shows, so like we have your trigger output, this is what we are triggering off of going into channel one of our oscilloscope coming from the pulse generator. And so we had our output, this is sending our signal into our transmitter antenna, and that's going into our receiver, which we put through filters and we amplified our good signal going into channel two. So that's kind of how our setup works, and that's what we ran with. So then for, if the cork if you guys didn't know, like this is what our oscilloscope was, and we were running our pulse generator, so it's kind of that picture, but that's our trigger output, it's going into channel one. That was our output, and then that's running through, you know, our transmitter antenna, and then that's going in channel two, and that's our pulse right there. So our testing, like our very first day we got here, we kind of just like went outside and we're like, okay, let's see if we can see a signal, and like that was terrible, that didn't work at all. So then we started, we took it back inside, and we um, started actually trying to see if we could see a signal, and we ended up just kept refining it and refining it until we just went from the pulse generator right into the oscilloscope and we're like, okay, let's try and actually see a pulse. So we just kind of kept messing with that and we just worked our way up to um, testing, like, let's transmit a pulse. So we were able to like see a pulse from the pulse generator into the scope, which actually wasn't that difficult. So then we worked our way up into actually transmitting a pulse. So you can't see it's off-screen, but we had our cart, as in the photo I showed you earlier, on this side right here, hooked up to our transmitter, and we are transmitting right here and receiving it into a scope on this side. And so what we wanted to do with this setup was eventually take it outside and test it on different surfaces to see how these different surfaces affected our signal that we were receiving. And so that's important because that is gonna show us like what kind of, like how those surfaces and how when we change the height of it and its distance affects the destructive interference that is there. So when you change it, the height and distance of the setup, that's gonna change the angle that your reflected pulse or it, the reflected path is hitting the ground, which in turn like changes the time delay. So that can change like how fast it's coming and it changes like, so how fast it's gonna come in, right? And it interferes with your direct path. So 
Um, we also changed, so we changed it at four different heights and on different settings. And so at each different height, we changed the polarization of our antenna. So when your antenna is vertically polarized, it's sending out vertically polarized waves. And so when a vertically polarized wave hits a surface, it inverts. So that, if it hits the direct wave, it will destructively interfere with it if it is like matched up in the right way. So we tested this setup at a variety of different surfaces. So we tested that on the sidewalk. We tested it on a reflector that we used uh, for an L zone to be calculated, which is like 16 square meters, so it's huge. Um, we tested it on grass. We tested it on sand, which we like smoothed out and made a textured. So we tested at each of these, we tested four different heights at each different height, vertically and horizontally polarized, and at different distances. We didn't have enough time to test both distances on sand, so all the data I'm going to show you is going to be at 10 meters apart. So after we tested it, we analyzed our data, and so we compiled graphs like using all this data that we took at uh, these different settings and everything, and so we compared these voltages and we calculated power to see like what, ge like, what geometric setting is giving us either what's giving us like the best voltage or we're trying to see like what setting is giving us the most interference. So here's an example of a graph that we would have after we took data. So our x-axis here is time in seconds and our y-axis here is amplitude. So it's an amplitude versus time graph. It's just an example of something we had done. So um, getting into our actual data, uh, at sidewalk and grass, our geometric um, setting was the same for both that produced the greatest voltage and greatest received voltage and power. It was a horizontally polarized antenna at a height of 160 centimeters, but it, that produced the same power at uh, 0.15 volts squared. But you can see that grass had a greater voltage at uh, 0.34 volts. So that kind of shows that sidewalk had more interference going on because it had 0.29 volts. So here's a um, comparison. So on the left here is a voltage graph, and then right here is a power graph. And so the x-axis is height, the y-axis is um, power for this graph, and the amplitude for that graph. So our yellow line here is a horizontally, horizontally polarized gra uh, grass, and our blue line is just horizontally polarized sidewalk. So you can see that horizontally polarized is greater for both. So that kind of shows that ver vertically polarized is getting more interference. So uh, our reflector, it actually had, um, so the geometric uh, setup of that still produced um, the greatest voltage and power, which, um, which was a horizontally polarized antenna at a height of 160, and that produced uh, a power of 0.25 volts squared, which was uh, one of the higher ones, but it only produced a, a voltage of 0.03. So that was, shows that it's quite a bit of interference happening there. So here is the comparison graphs of that. The left is voltage and the right is power. And the blue line is horizontally polarized. The red line is vertically polarized. So on sand, it still had the same geometric settings, a horizontally polarized antenna. I had a height of 160 centimeters, but um, our voltage was found, our highest voltage was found in texture sand and our greatest power was found in smooth sand, but they were found at like very minuscule differences. So in texture sand, it was only 0.006 volts greater than in smooth sand, and then power was only found 0.002 volts squared greater than in texture sand. So it wasn't that much of a difference compared. So, so as you can see in these graphs, um, the horizontally polarized textured and smooth sand, like the blue in the whole horizontally textured, it's barely above here in the voltage graph. And then here, the yellow line, which is the, hor the horizontally polarized smooth sand, it's barely above the blue line here. So, And then here, it's this is kind of a messy graph, but this is the overall comparison for um, all of the max voltages of all of the settings we had at a distance of 10 meters. So this dark green line right here, that's the uh, vertically polarized uh, sidewalk. So anything below that that doesn't um, like go up, that's all that stays 
that's all uh, vertically polarized. So the vertically polarized settings, those all stay pretty low. Like those don't really increase very much. But what peaks up right here is um, the sand. Those are the horizontally polarized uh, sand measurements that we took. So that, that shows that um, sand is our great, that, that gave us our greatest received voltage. And same thing here with power. This dark green line right here is our uh, sidewalk power, vertically polarized. Anything below that was, uh, that doesn't peak up again, is our uh, vertically polarized. So vertically polarized is consistently staying lower than horizontally polarized data. So um, some conclusions and next steps that we had was that sand had the greatest increase of received voltage. So it started out low, which means that at the lower levels, like the lower heights, it probably had a lot of interference, but then as it increased and it got to 160 centimeters, it uh, increased a lot. So the voltage um, went up and we were receiving a lot of voltage. And so the reflector on concrete had the most interference throughout. It gave us the lowest readings at every height. And so if we had more time with this, we would, and for future uh, groups who do this, we would definitely ask, like, uh, tell them to change the height and distance more dramatically um, because that is important for the time delay of the reflected path and the direct path because we started calculations to predict the reflected pulse and our calculations at three meters that was only about it was only about uh, two nanoseconds which isn't really enough to give you a good prediction of like when your reflected path is coming in. So like if you can really get it a lot higher and if you can either move it a lot closer without like interfering, then you can start either seeing like when your second pulse is coming, like when your reflected path is coming, then that's gonna be a lot more beneficial for your uh, data. And our h pole consistently had a greater voltage received, which like I said earlier, could be pinned down to your uh, vertically polarized uh, signal is when it bounces off of the ground or bounces off of your surface, it inverts and it interferes with your direct path. And um, if we had more time, I would definitely say more tests on sand because that gave us the best results. It gave us the greatest voltages in powers. And it's possible that some of the tests that were lower that gave us the uh, low readings could be like un the underlying surface of sand. It could have been wet and there's like possibly like mud like lower down in the sand so some of our signals sent out could have been like shot underneath that so that could be have been causing possible error in sand so like a better surface of sand might have give, been giving us better readings so that could be nothing and so so obstacles that we saw like for me personally I literally had no idea what an oscilloscope was like before starting so like I couldn't tell like when we first started like I couldn't tell like if something was going right or like going wrong like I mean, like I didn't know. So, um, like reading the manuals and like starting to just figure stuff out was really beneficial because then I could um, like start saying, okay, well this should be happening. Like, okay, um, this is how we can fix this. So like just literally learning how to use like what my <laughs> experiment was based on was kind of important. So that was like my biggest obstacle, just not knowing what an oscilloscope was basically. Um, Overheating equipment kind of played into a, like a was a big deal because it was started getting really hot and so we started trying to cover the equipment and just make sure we weren't outside for too long and just making sure we were being really quick and getting a lot better and also like not knowing how to use it we were outside for kind of a bit longer than probably like if any of you guys are out there taking data would have been so we were out there probably longer so we but once we got better at using the equipment we were like in and out pretty quick and um, taking data, again, like we didn't know how to, so it took us like three days to like find in a manual like how to take data, and then we were able to do that. So that wasn't a big obstacle, but it was still like, why can't we figure this out? This should be pretty easy. But then we did, so it was, it was okay. Um, are there any questions? Yeah. So Jasmine, I have, I have a question. So I, I think you're, um, I guess for me, the most important plot is the one where you um, did the reflections and was that off? That was off of aluminum. Yeah. Okay. And how 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 big was the aluminum? It was uh, 16 square meters. That was huge. Yeah. Um, 
And I only recall seeing two, two traces on that plot. Um, and as, as you said, H pole is much larger because V pole is presumably getting destructive interference. I think it was, I think it was maybe one. Uh, so the, the blue line was H pole, the red line was V pole. Okay. So, um, let's see. So the, um, the effect is more dramatic as you go to um, greater height. And it's mostly because of the fact that H pole is increasing, which, so, so for, you know, for H pole, there is, there is still uh, interference, except it's not destructive. I think it's, it's, in, uh, it's constructive. Yeah. Um, so I guess if you had more time, you would try and quantify that. But, but yeah, so V, so, um, so V pole is pretty much constant, just telling you that you're, that for all your heights, the interference is, is pretty much the same. So I guess this is this is sort of this is this sort of a worst case scenario for what we can anticipate for for Ariana. Well, actually, I was curious because um, you said that it's uh, the highest amplitude is when you're getting the worst reflection, right? So you have the least power in your reflected pulse, meaning that your destructive interference is less, so the amplitude is higher, right? So like, you're saying that the, the destructive interference is lower for grass than for sand, right? That's why the amplitude's hard? Yes. Okay. I mean, it could be that there's like more constructive interference That's what for I was grass, wondering, yeah. But I mean, I, I, like, I don't know how to like differ between the two. Right. I guess it'd just be like how much power would be there but I mean comparing like grass and concrete I say that because like grass and concrete are the same powers and like concrete just has less amplitude so like I don't know. So it makes sense that the reflection off of grass is just worse so your amplitude is higher so you're getting less destructive interference. That's, yeah. that's your conclusion. Okay. I mean but it's also possible that there's like more constructive interference but I just right. don't know a way to differ between the two. Sure. Other questions for Jasmine?